Greetings, dear friends. We are sincerely glad to welcome you again. And today we're going to talk to the esteemed Igor Mikhailovich Danilov. Greetings. Igor Mikhailovich, in the previous video we touched upon the topic of slavery and that a person doesn't always realize that some life ideals and goals are imposed on him. And the decisions he often makes during the day are dictated not by his own desires or even his needs, but they're often dictated precisely by fears. Throughout the day, a person experiences thousands of fears. They can be either apparent or latent, rational or irrational. In many cases, these are certainly irrational fears, when nothing really threatens a person. Still, there is one fear that is absolutely rational — the fear of death. Because death is probably the only stable event in everyone's life. It is something that a person knows about for sure, and he knows with certainty that it will happen to him during his lifetime. So there is the following point. Why does knowledge about death not really impact a person's life? Meaning he doesn't think about this very often. Far from every week does a person even think about it. What prevents a person from understanding that he is mortal? And there is actually one more important point. Why, when a person sees other people's deaths, when he sees victims of, I don't know, cataclysms, disasters, wars, and so on, his first thought is not compassion and help to his neighbor, but precisely, thank God it has happened not to me. I'm alive, I'm fine, thank God. You know, when you look at this situation, when you see how consciousness works in a person, you can't help but wonder whether society and every person living in that society can actually be sincerely compassionate about another person's problems. Or for us people, it is some kind of, I don't know, a fleeting, impressive picture that you want to quickly get rid of. All of this is very brief, emotional, but still brief. Well, it's natural. What attracts a person? Someone's suffering? Someone's death? Let's look at how we people behave when someone, for example, gets hit by a car, okay? A crowd gathers, everyone is standing and watching, everyone is afraid, everyone experiences fear at this time. But everyone, as you said, thinks, thank God, it's not me. Yet everyone puts that shirt on for a little while, but he puts it on. For a little while. And strives to take it off. Why? It causes discomfort. That's why people try to avoid such evident pictures, but at the same time, they attract them. As for what you said, that people don't think about death for weeks. I don't think so. They do, and quite often. As for the fact that we don't believe, or more correctly, we don't realize, we believe that our life is finite, yet we don't realize that we are mortal. Why? Because our consciousness is arranged in such a way that we understand this in theory. We have seen others die, we understand it. And we understand that we will die, too. But we don't believe that life ends at this point. You see? Why? Because our consciousness understands perfectly well that life, after the death of the physical body, will continue for it, at least for consciousness. And as personality, we know that it will continue in different hypostases. Personality certainly strives for eternal life. However, it also understands that even without gaining eternal life, a human becomes a subpersonality. Each of us has this understanding. If we dig inside, even in consciousness, that's why there is no fear of death, but there is fear of dying, most of all. We are afraid of what we don't know. We don't know what is beyond that threshold. And that's what scares us. Moreover, it's very frightening that something is going to change. We are afraid of changes. That provokes fear, too. We are afraid of losing what we have here, our relatives, loved ones, friends. This is also frightening. A person is actually not afraid of death itself. Most people die very quietly. They don't gasp for air, they don't scream, and they don't make noise. 
they just pass away quietly. Although beforehand, almost everyone understands that this is going to happen. People are actually… well, I don't consider accidents, murders or something else. But when the time comes, a person gets old and sick, he feels that death is coming and he doesn't panic. Most people pass away quietly. There is another point, Igor Mihailovich. We talked about the fact that people are not always concerned about people dying near them. But let's take such a thing as compassion. Is compassion actually inherent in consciousness? In consciousness, it is not. Consciousness has an understanding that such a thing can happen to it. It has a fear that this can happen to it. But consciousness has practically no compassion. And there's also an interesting pattern. Compassion is more pronounced in animals than in humans, at the level of consciousness. A human often has this compassion from the mind, so to say, when someone is watching him. After all, we live in socium, in society, and we are more afraid of being judged for not providing help. But if a person let's say, understands that no one will find out that he hasn't provided help to someone, he often simply doesn't provide it. Wow. There's a simple formula here. The higher a person's spirituality, the higher the empathy. From here, mercy, mutual help, and everything else follow. So, the less a person is developed spiritually, and that is really true, friends, the less mercy that person has. Let me give you a simple example to make it clear. For example, a person was hit by a car and someone saw it. Well, let's just take a person who saw another person hit by a car. He provided first aid, called an ambulance and found out that the person had a difficult financial situation. He even provided him with material assistance. And as a rule, people tend to forget about it, proud of the fact that they have provided assistance, even though they are well aware, even after waiting for the ambulance, hearing from the paramedics who came in the ambulance that the person will have to undergo a lot of surgeries, but he will live. So realizing and knowing that a person is going to incur huge expenses, people try to move move away from that. It's a rare exception that they continue to help, that is, to support a person to the end. Why? Well, it's not my friend and it's not my acquaintance, or something else, meaning it's not someone who will judge me if I don't do that. He's a stranger. A stranger. So it's okay not to help. But the higher people's spirituality is, the higher mercy is, the higher their aspiration to help is. That is, people cannot but provide assistance. Do you mean that this mercy and sympathy is already the result of a person's spiritual life? That this is the quality of personality? Yes, it actually relates more to personality. You know, it is interesting that also in Buddhism they used to say that by this criterion, whether you have mercy or not, one can understand to what extent your spiritual life is correct, right. to what extent your meditation is correct. Certainly. So this criterion… It means that when a person develops spiritually, he develops human qualities in himself. And human qualities are precisely expressed in that very mercy, in compassion. And this is normal. This is splendid. But you know, Igor Mihailovich, we live in a world where, unfortunately, there are a great many people who do not mature spiritually, yes. who do not work on themselves. And still, if we talk about compassion and mutual help within the framework of consciousness, so to say, it turns out that many people anticipate and expect that perhaps something is supposed to happen, I don't know, maybe some major cataclysms where a lot of people will die. And these people will be so impressed that at that moment compassion will awaken in them, and they will start acting and taking some decisions. They won't. You see, there is one more problem. A person has died. And when this is even shown to us, for instance, on television, yes. we are shown an image of that person. They tell us about his life and show us how he died. Compassion and empathy for that person arise in us. However, if we are shown millions of people killed in mass, that already turns into statistics and we won't have empathy. The only thing we will have is a fear that we could have been there. Or, God forbid, this would happen to me and I would be among those people who died. 
Oh, this is human nature. So the further we enter the stage of, let's say, climate disasters, cataclysms, and so on, the less reaction the number of mass casualties will provoke in people who do not work spiritually. Right. Our empathy will decrease, but instead, selfishness will be manifested more, and there will be more fears for one's own destiny. Moreover, I emphasize, exactly for one's own destiny. People will search for ways to adapt. If the situation continues the way it is going now, and there are no changes towards improving the situation, let's say, towards developing the creative society or implementing some alternative to it, then the further we go, the more we will see how people's empathy will decrease very sharply. I would even say, catastrophically, that's inevitable. It is the issue of survival, the survival of humankind. I very well remember how you once said that it is actually the system doing all this. Of course. And when a person is a part of the system, he sort of cannot have a critical and bad attitude to the fact that right. he himself… To what the Master is doing. The Master is doing, as it turns out. Let's take an honest look at the situation in the world right now, okay? Crises, we won't list them, are on a massive scale, apart from the climate. After all, we are the ones who do that, or those whom we elected for ourselves do that. Isn't this true? And that's where the problem arises from. So who is to blame? You look around and there is such a feeling, you know, that the world has gone mad. Understanding what is now happening to the climate, what is awaiting humanity, yet we observe the situation that is going on. We understand that at any moment a nuclear war or anything else might flare up, but we are actually the ones who do that. If it's impossible to fight the climate, then there is a question, why are we trying to get ahead of it? What is the rationale behind that? And the most interesting thing is that a huge number of people, smart and literate ones, understanding that this is wrong, understanding that really terrible things are happening right now, that there is a rupture and division of people. I'm not even talking about deaths, mass deaths of people, but it is really happening. Yet we are silent and do nothing. Isn't that a decrease in empathy? Isn't that a loss of spirituality? At the time when we, pardon me, have entire institutions of religions working and billions and billions of believers, as they say. But the question is, where are they? This is a very important understanding because you realize that at the level of consciousness, neither empathy nor compassion will turn on of in you. Of course, they won't. And when you know that, you at least act contrary to these very stereotypical scenarios of the system. You understand that you shouldn't expect compassion and sympathy neither from others nor from yourself when you are at the level of consciousness. Of course. Thus, you shouldn't expect that you will manifest this compassion, and since it's a stereotypical scenario of the system, then what are you waiting for? You should already act in some way. I mean, if you see what is happening in this world, you should direct your entire attention not towards some kind of self-torment, not towards anxiety, but exactly towards concrete steps. Because fear is the absence of a strategy, isn't it? And this strategy is being covered up from us. A person doesn't know what to do in this society. That's why people are apathetic and do not act. One should start with oneself. Because they understand that whatever they do, it sort of brings no result. I'll put it simply. Understanding what is happening now, and based on all of that, it's important for each and every one, my friends, to engage in their spiritual development. Why? It is definitely necessary. Let's say, all together, we can change a lot, but as long as we are divided, as long as we are not united by one idea to improve the life of each and every one, including each one of us, friends, we will be divided, and we won't be able to control the situation, we won't be able to improve anything. And since we cannot improve anything, it means we must do our best for our spiritual salvation and spiritual development. Isn't that right? There is also another thing, Igor Mikhailovich. Many people are troubled by the fact that, let's say, those things which impressed them just yesterday, those events which take place in the world, those pictures which they saw, suddenly, at some moment, do not work because either a person's psyche adapts or there is something else. And the terrible thing is that a person suddenly realizes that all this doesn't concern him, that he becomes sort of insensitive or inhuman. Adaptation. Adaptation to the situation. 
I'll repeat once again, when we see the death of one person, it's a tragedy. When it assumes a mass scale, it becomes statistics. We adapt to it, and it no longer touches us that much. You see, again, it's like when someone has got into trouble, we have provided assistance, so we have helped, and that's it. Let the person get out of the situation on his own, right? But what if the person cannot do that? If the situation itself doesn't let him, where is our mercy then? Where is our compassion? A simple question. In other words, you know, it's as if consciousness needs more and more impressive of course. pictures for this. And let's look at how our television and the news channels develop. They actually show us more and more of what is called atrocity, don't they? When it's already simply disgusting to watch. Isn't that so? Because they try to impress us. Yet, what does the system need this for? Concentration. Fear is concentrated attention. Fuel. One hundred percent. Whichever way we slice it and no matter what we do, the system hunts for our attention. Everybody needs our attention. And we try to attract each other's attention. A lot of people believe that manifestation of this kind of firmness, insensitivity, sort of coldness, is right. That various manifestations of emotions, when a person may cry, for example, when his relative has passed away or something else, it is primarily a manifestation of weakness in a person, because he thus gives attention to the system, and so on and so forth. You know, Tatiana, there was a good expression, soulless. So when a person tries to become soulless, that's what he actually becomes. In fact, many people are afraid to manifest joy as well. It's the same. So any emotions, not only sorrow, but also… A human isn't an emotional being. The only question is, who is behind that? And who orders one or another emotion for you and what for? You see? When we are emotional, when anger, hatred, or something else awakens in us, those are actually such outbursts of our attention, the largest and most significant ones. We expend our energy, we expend not only prana, but also a lot. Well, it's for those who know what it is, you see? In other words, we discharge our vital energy. This is really so. But when our emotion is filled with joy and true love, that's on the contrary good. Again, let's consider, does a person experience joy when serving the devil? No. He can experience euphoria due to endorphins or artificially injected drugs. This is euphoria, and a person falls into delusion. He may experience momentary joy from some kind of acquisition or good news. For instance, when he is praised or paid attention to a little bit. Yet, do these joys last for long? They don't. They are short-lived, right? Everything is short-lived, everything is momentary, and quickly disappears. And as a rule, this joy is followed by sadness. But when a person develops spiritually, what does he start to experience? First and foremost, the presence of peace, then joy, and afterwards, even pleasure. That's already when a person has a pronounced contact. Does this really end? No, it doesn't end. It only increases. And the more it increases, the more it starts affecting even emotions. You know, a person is like a fool, as they say, he sits and smiles. Why? Because he feels good. He doesn't care about the world anymore because he feels wonderful. He no longer wants to pay attention to those situations, to this news, to problems, to politics and to climate, to put it mildly. Why? Because he feels wonderful, he begins to live. Isn't it an emotion? It's an emotion, but it is of a different nature, and it's not short-lived, right? And he feels life in another person, Surely. and the potential that is inherent in another person, and he certainly values that potential. Right. But it's when a person really begins to develop to such an extent that he starts feeling others. Then it is so. It becomes even more joyful when you meet another person who is also filled with love. Yet, there is another point I would like to note. When a person is filled with this love and joy, even when he faces the sorrow of others, this inner joy does not cease. But again, there is that which you and I have listed. Mercy and compassion are manifested, and there is an understanding 
and an aspiration to help doesn't end, but joy doesn't go away. Why? Because you even understand that what happens to a person is only happening to his body and his temporary existence here, right? If you can change something, you change it. If you can improve something, you improve it. It's a natural aspiration of yours, yet the joy doesn't go away. But when a person exists, let's say, in a closed system of his consciousness, when demons rule over him, then, of course, there is a flurry of emotions, meaning, a moment ago he was rejoicing and he immediately cries, a moment ago he was crying, and then he laughs again. The system arranges incessant swings. Why? It throws a person from one extreme to another and locks him on himself. Hence, there arises literally self-torment. Later on, people say that a person is depressed. He is not depressed. It is ordinary selfishness, let's say. He takes care of only himself. What for? To draw attention to himself. And a person is only concerned about attracting attention to himself. That is why the more a person works and develops spiritually, the less he needs other people's attention. He just doesn't care anymore. But there's another side effect, my friends. Other people's opinions stop influencing you. Why? Because you don't depend on other people's attention. In other words, the opinion of the demons in someone else's head somehow doesn't evoke emotions, let's say, right? Well, for some people, it's a minus, while for others, it's a plus. But you can understand it only when you develop, let's say, to a certain degree. Great, Igor Mikhailovich. Yes, it's great. There is another question. Talking about fears, actually fear has a bad company, aggression, anger and the like, and people being in fear, being in slavery to the system, just cannot be happy a priori, let alone to be happy in the consumerist format of society. Is there any way to get rid of these fears in general? Is it possible not to fear at all, not to be afraid of death at all? Can a spiritually free person, let's say, not be afraid? Spiritual development and fear, how do these categories… What is the correlation between them, what right? What is the correlation, right? The correlation is very simple. The more you, let's say, develop spiritually as personality, the more you come to understand and realize that all your fears are formed merely in your consciousness. My friend, a human as personality cannot be afraid. He simply cannot be afraid of anything in this material world. All fears are in consciousness. Let's say, does a person experience fear on the spiritual path? In the beginning, yes. But the further he goes, the less and less he feels it as a human. But when he achieves spiritual salvation during his lifetime, does he get rid of fear? As a human, of course he does. But at the level of consciousness, all fears remain, isn't that so? I'll give a simple example, my friends, those who are watching us for the first time and are not familiar with Alatra. This may be not quite clear to you, but to our Alatra people, I think it will be clear. Let's recall Jesus Christ when He left His body while being on the cross, how His consciousness yelled. Yes, consciousness did, but not Him. That's the point. And there is also the following point, Igor Mihailovich. You said that when a human passes away, let's say prana ends, and there is sort of a natural death, he is sort of aware of what is happening to him. But does the system know in advance when a person will pass away? Of course. It does. The system knows that, consciousness knows that, and personality knows that, but a human doesn't know. Whoa. The question is, where is a human Where then? is a human? Who is he? Who is he then? Everyone knows everything while he is in the dark. When a person is in Satan's slavery, he is nobody. Consciousness lives instead of him. Personality is underdeveloped, while consciousness is, let's say, a manipulator. Naturally, in this case, he doesn't know much. In order for a human to be aware of that, well, there are many examples of this kind. Let's look at the lives of saints, okay? Who warned in advance of their departure? Let's look at the lives of mages, who also warned of their departure in advance. 
A person has definitely decided whether he is on one or the other side. Of course, that's right. Meaning a person has to make a choice. That is why, in ancient religions, approximately at the age of 14, well, at the second surge, a person decides whether he is with God or with Satan. Who is he with? Isn't that so? This is a very important element. Why? Because a person consciously chooses whom to serve. I brought this topic up also because people mentioned that they noticed how all of a sudden, before the death of a near and dear person, circumstances in their life unfolded in a way that either a week or a couple of days before the death of that person, bad thoughts came or conflict situations arose, and afterwards people were overwhelmed with a huge sense of guilt. For being wrong towards him. Yes. And a person passed away, and so on. But the system actually prepares it all. It happens far and wide. Not always, thank God, but quite often. There is another question, Igor Mikhailovich. We often discussed that after death, a human can expect either life or death, that he will become either a subpersonality, a spiritual being or a subpersonality. But there is also a state of peace about which little has been actually said. What is this state of peace? What is needed for a person to sort of deserve it? Who can grant peace to a human? I would like to discuss this topic as well. Whether it is good or bad? Yes. Yes. Well, I'll put it this way. As of today, it's a huge reward for any person. Why? Because subpersonality doesn't sleep. We lose the function of sleep after we leave the body anyway. Angels don't sleep, and subpersonalities don't sleep. Sleep exists only here. Sleep is necessary for a physical body and necessary for personality to rest from consciousness. Although, again, even during sleep there are dreams, that is, the activity of consciousness which prevents personality from resting, and we perceive all that. So, the state of peace, is it good or bad? It is very good. A simple example, a person hasn't attained spiritual salvation, he hasn't gained life, so he is already inevitably doomed to sufferings, which can last for thousands of years. It is eternity in hell. Well, no matter how they brighten it up, and no matter what they call it, the state of subpersonality is really scary. And the saddest thing is that each of us knows this if we look, so to say, into ourselves. Why? Because everyone has this understanding. Let's put it so. Of course, thanks to religions, it all has been described for us quite differently, that we reside somewhere in a physical body or something else. No, each of us knows the truth, knows what's going to happen. A person remains the same as he is, absolutely nothing changes except his body the same thoughts and emotions. It's just that they intensify. Everything becomes brighter, everything becomes more real. And you know, the scariest thing is that memory returns. After becoming a subpersonality, a person remembers every moment of his life, each moment, and will relive it billions of times, evaluating, I should have acted that way, I should have done that. And plus the state itself, when there is no body but phantom pains remain, Let's say, it is a sense of burning, it is physics, a sense of compression. And this was noted by many people, even by those who had been on the other side for a short period of time and came back. This is really true. Well, it's been talked about, too. Say, it wasn't invented by us. So these are historical facts. When the prophets spoke about how a human would feel, and now imagine the state of peace. You fall asleep, your death is a dream. You just fall asleep, and that's it. In other words, a person deserves to be released from suffering. You see? Well, is that mercy or not? It's a tremendous mercy. It's not salvation, but it's a tremendous escape, a deliverance from pain, suffering, and worries. Because the state of subpersonality is not life. It is torment, it is punishment. You know, those people who for some reason do not set for themselves the maximum goals of spiritual salvation will ask themselves a question, how to earn at least peace? What can be done for that? Well, it was mentioned a long time ago, 
the tithe. Unexpectedly. Yes, you should invest 10% of your attention in your spiritual development every day. That's the minimum. And here again, if a person leads a way of life where he, let's say, deceives people, let's say, slightly serves the system, slightly, I emphasize, he gives short weight, he deceives, he isn't quite honest, he allows a lot of anger in himself, but still, this anger doesn't prevail in him. A person still stops himself, but at the same time, he allows, sort of, an ordinary human weakness, so to speak. In this case, a person needs to spend 20% of his time on spiritual development, that is, to be in practices. This has been so since very ancient times and up to this day. 10%, 20% of attention during the day. Yes, to put it simply, to be two and a half or five hours in practices every day and do one's best to be a human being during the day. Okay, a question about the tithe. So, the tithe is not an invention of the Apaxians or Atlanteans… Of course not. …and their descendants, meaning… No. What is it? It is not… Th let's take… Is it a way of making profit or where? Okay, right. Tatiana, let's go back to the Apaxians. The Apaxians created religion as a tool okay. where they appointed themselves gods and forced people to massively give their attention to them. Whereas attention, I repeat, is life energy. So people themselves, just like cows give milk, you know, people themselves simply gave their own life to the Apexians. However, to those who gave more attention and gave it more diligently, who praised them and were an example to others, the Apexians gave means for living in greater amounts than to others. They raised them above the crowd, appointing them rulers over the crowd and authorities, you see? Well, for the first time, the tithe was mentioned in the Old Testament, perhaps… And they restored people's health. This is somehow connected with the Torah. I disagree with you. I disagree. Yes, it is believed that for the first time, the tithe was mentioned in the Torah. Abraham gave a tithe, right? Yes, Abraham gave a tithe. In modern civilization, the first time the tithe was mentioned as something that went without saying and existed for centuries. Those were the mentions by the Sumerians. They kept records of tithes, taxes, and everything else. The tithe was mentioned, among other things. The tithe dates back to much earlier times before the Sumerians. Okay, this is interesting. How, let's say… Well, that's if we mean the material tithe, right? Not as paying attention in practices, but as paying with something material. How can material means property or something else affect a person's after-death destiny? <laughs> okay, let's touch upon the following point then. When did the tithe appear? And what is it in general? Those were the times when people still lived in communities. Those were still the times of the Latiara. A commune. Of communes. But when this very consumerist format of ours already began to slip in, meaning when the underground people already became active and this Agartha started coming out, you see? Gradually and slowly influencing people's opinions. But as we already discussed quite a long time ago, it happened when a decline in the Alatiara themselves took place. That is, when the devil had seduced them as well. That's what the decay started from. The community began to slowly slide from the spiritual format to the consumerist one. Back then, there were communities where, as I say, there was everything you needed, and you didn't need anything excessively. But later on, with the decay of spirituality. I'll put it this way, a concept of mind emerged in society. Private property. Right. And this private property began to divide the community. In other words, there emerged farmers, there emerged artisans who started crafting something, but there were also people in society who really strove for spirituality and continued spiritual salvation. 
What solution did the Latiara find? After all, it is them who introduced this tithe. That happened a very, very long time before the Torah, let's say. Let me explain. A person works in a field. He has to work from morning till night in order to grow something that is necessary for the whole community. But it is his private property. Let's put it in the modern language. It is his business that started. He needs it in order to exchange his products for clothes or meat because there is another farmer who raises animals, cattle, or a hunter who hunts from morning till night. Do you understand? So a natural exchange process took place, if we put this in modern terms. Barter deals took place, you know, such a material exchange. A person didn't even have two and a half hours. Why? Because he left early in the morning and came back late in the evening. If he would perform practices, he would just fall asleep. That's what actually happened. And for this very reason, the issue arose. Yet, society needed what he grew or what he made. Society needed that. There was a great need for those very food products, clothes, and so on. Thus, private business started. Own territories appeared. What to do in such a case? Should those people perish or should they give up their jobs? If everyone is saving themselves, well, there is a part of people who… Sure, of course. Why? Because when there was a community, everything was distributed, and people had time for practice, everything was simple. However, with the emergence of private property, people began to split into, let's say, specific occupations. You see, they were forced to. So, couldn't a person even attain peace or what? It is clear that spiritual salvation should be earned on your own. You cannot buy it just like that. So, they came up with a simple formula. A person spent the equivalent of 100% of his attention on growing crops, yet he was supposed to spend at least 10% on attaining peace. So, he gave 10% of his harvest to the community. What did the community do? It distributed what was given to it. It was as an equivalent of attention. I'm explaining again. Because a person spent his time on that harvest, he spent his attention, his life on growing it. So the 10% were allocated to those people who really engaged in spiritual self-development. And not only that, but they worked for the spiritual world, so to say. They promoted, developed that, and so on. Thus, this percentage was allocated to the service for the spiritual world, to those who defended the rights and tried to retain, let's say, the dominance of the spiritual in the whole society at that time. This way compensation took place. Where were those funds directed? If a person, I'll tell you now, if a person dealt with exchange processes, while exchange is trade, people always strove to be more profitable, right? They always tried to make those deals more profitable for themselves. Thus, there was cheating and a little bit of lying. Somewhere they weighed it wrong, somewhere they did something else. Why? Because business began. A person realized that he gave a bad product for a very high price, so to say. What could be done in that case? If in his life a person trades dishonestly and does many other things, that which, for example, the Prophet, the last prophet, yes. the greatest of people, prohibited. So what could be done in such a case? Yet, a person had such a job, he was involved in trade. What the Alatriyara offered was 20%. Just like in life, you have to spend 20%. In the same way here, you have to give 20% of your attention, the equivalent of attention, and then you get peace. Question, where and how was it spent? It was actually spent on sustaining those who were engaged to a hundred percent, almost a hundred percent. Well, a hundred percent is impossible, but at least ninety to ninety-five percent of their attention was spent on life and on serving the spiritual world here, exactly on its interests. That percentage was spent solely on them. In this way, it was all compensated. So it suits the spiritual world because everything is fair. And it suits the system, everything is fair. In other words, everything was on parity, and a person attained peace. For this very reason, since that time and up to this day, if a person does something very good for the spiritual world, which contributes, let's say, to implementation or advancement 
of certain things that, I'll put it carefully, are beneficial to the spiritual world here, in this dead world, a person automatically receives, well, let's say, peace, peace for sure. I wanted to say salvation, but not easily. In order to receive salvation, a person has to really do a lot, but such cases also happen. And Jesus demonstrated it all, that as a higher being, He can give, He can grant life eternal. And this is true. The only question is that, yes, this person gains life, but he gains it. Well, again, in this world, we have to speak in the language of statuses, hierarchies, and the like. But you cannot say that an angel is underdeveloped, can you? Is it sort of deformed, or what else is wrong with him? Okay, let's give the following example to make it clear. A person is on his spiritual path here in this dead environment. The inevitably dead one, I emphasize again. If someone doesn't understand what I'm talking about, I'll tell you. Everything in this world is mortal. Even the universe comes to an end. Not to mention galaxies, planets, and all the more, us. So, there is no point in arguing about that, friends. It is inevitably dead, and it is extremely important to gain eternity here. Right? Right. In this dead world. Mm -hmm. So, when a person follows the spiritual path here, he comes out, you know, like a high school graduate, and now he has to go to the university. To the university. Right. It's an angel who goes to the university. Mm -hmm. But if we take a person to that world who hasn't gone through this school, mm -hmm. it's the same as if we would send him to a kindergarten. While here, within a very short period of time, personality really evolves to great heights. And what if we take a bodhisattva? I mean, a person can become a bodhisattva within a lifetime. Meanwhile, a bodhisattva is already a true service. It's an adult angel, or let's say, it's not just a university graduate, for instance, a bachelor, but a master, so to say. Or he already has a science degree. For example, a professor, if we put it in our language, that's the level of a bodhisattva. However, a person can do that here. Why? Because the conditions are such, and indeed, here, in these conditions, a human, as an angel, develops much faster. While there, what can happen here within a hundred years? There it can last a hundred billion years, according to our timing. Why hurry when you have eternity? So, granting salvation is an extremely rare case when there are really God's messengers in the world. It is rare, and it has to be earned. There has to be a great benefit for the spiritual world from a person. Yet, in the story of Jesus Christ, it was a tremendous help for the spiritual world. Why? Because it was a great example that is significant for believers to this day. Even now, we have used this example to explain to you, friends, the simplicity and understanding of it all. Igor Mikhailovich, is it possible to influence a person's after-death destiny if a person suddenly failed, let's say, to merge with his soul and become an angel? It's just that it's mentioned. Well, in many religions it is said that if people pray for a person or give alms for him while he was a sinner, they will sort of relieve his sufferings in the fiery hell. That has a double meaning. Let me explain the deception from the system. When we begin to recall a subpersonality, it really feels a relief. But we take away from the alive and give that to the inevitably dead. Let the dead take care of their dead. Isn't that right? That doesn't mean we cannot recall. We will certainly recall relatives, near and dear people. Yet one shouldn't live by this image, shouldn't be emotional and bring that image to life. But what do we do? Right. When we pray, we recall an image and a name. Of course. We are even obliged to pray, to recall, to worry, to talk, to apologize, or something else. To whom? To the dead. Isn't that true? In other words, to give away our alive, vital. And when we give it to the dead, it's not just our time. It's a huge amount of our life, which is mostly taken by the system itself, and 10% is left for a subpersonality itself. But it's enough for it to make 
Let's say, imagine unbearable heat and a sip of cold water. Well, this is wonderful, isn't it? For a while, but not forever. We relieve, but we don't remove suffering. Yet, there is another question. Can we obtain forgiveness for him through prayers? No. Can we redeem it at our own expense? You know, like the tithe. Alms or the tithe. Yes, through alms or the tithe, okay? For instance, we go ahead and give our tithe for a dear beloved relative. No, that won't help. Why? Because he did nothing. He didn't save himself. He didn't take care of himself. Not even at 10%. We cannot do anything. Can we help relieve his life by giving alms? No. In no way. Yet, what have we been taught to do? On memorial days, we should commemorate, we should remember. Yes, exactly. Again, this is the trade of our life. It doesn't matter if we have given away sweets. We have actually given away fragments of our lives. And again, let's not forget about professional beggars, right? Yet, we are supposed to give to beggars. I'll give you a simple example. Next to a religious institution, which I had to pass by for many years, in one and the same place. There are professional beggars who are, well, it's a religious organization. There are a lot of pilgrims. So those beggars are sitting and begging. That's their job. I'll give a simple example. I worked for many years and had enough money. Nonetheless, when I saw that, you know, I was surprised. I knew that this professional beggar had an apartment in the center of the capital city. I didn't have one. He had a car, though a poor, not very good one. But then, that beggar acquired an iPhone, which had been recently released and which I couldn't afford. That doesn't mean I couldn't buy it. I could, but I spent the money to help you, friends, to serve the spiritual world, and didn't spend it on myself in such amounts. I used an old phone, just fine, while he acquired a new one. That's the answer for you, you see? to give alms. To whom? To whom? If it is to those who are truly in need, then it is your personal mercy. You show your mercy. Those are points to you, but not to a dead person who has died. But still, is it possible to help a dead person who has died? The answer is yes. This law was introduced by the Alatiara. All of this comes from them. But you can help only till the ninth day, after that, mm -hmm. everything is meaningless. When a subpersonality has already been identified as a subpersonality, then the process comes into legal force, let's put it so, and it cannot be appealed. It's impossible to help anymore. Yet, there are nine days which are very valuable. When a person has left his body, let's say, and has not yet decided, what does it mean, has not decided? This expression is not quite correct either. A person, when he dies and becomes a subpersonality, doesn't go anywhere from his soul. However, the soul doesn't go to that world either. There is simply a relocation from one person to another. I understand that for some, especially for people who are keen on religion, I emphasize keen on religion, but not people who know and believe in religion. There's a huge difference here. It can cause sort of, you know, what are you guys talking about? But I will put it this way, study your religions. Jesus spoke about relocation of souls, about reincarnation. All prophets spoke about relocation of souls and reincarnation and hell. The place of hell is only one. It is near your soul. You can't get away from the soul until it becomes free. This is a fact. So after leaving one body, the soul moves into another one. Almost immediately, right? If we measure it by our standards, it takes no more than 12 minutes. But if we measure it by other standards, it can be quite long. Mm -hmm. Yet, in our world, it takes 12 minutes. Mm -hmm. Although there can be long queues. So, nine days. The ninth day, the day of commemoration of the dead, is a very, very important day. That's where the nine days come from. Well, they also have three days, it's another period, which is also important. Right, forty. Forty days, one year, and so on. Why? Because when they described and explained that, it could take forty days according to our time, it could take a year, but it is actually twelve minutes at most. That's if we consider the time period. Now, they will again say that we mention 
My friends, I'll tell you where it started from and why, where it was confirmed and who used this experience. But this doesn't mean that we share, how to put it, their political belief. We simply refer to the experience of the Anar Neb. It was proven there by physical experiments. If you are interested, study it. Everything can be found and everything can be studied. Again, is it possible to attain salvation in religions? Yes, it is possible to attain salvation in any religion. But you should study those very religions, right? Mm -hmm. Why do people who call themselves believers stumble upon a lot of contradictions and stop at that? And what does this eventually end with? I sort of… I came to a priest, what he said is right, and I should believe him. Whom? The same mortal one as you are? Isn't it so? And in order to study and understand your religion and find that grain which the Prophet or Jesus or others gave, say, that very Zarathustra and many others, even Buddha, after all, let's say, that river which Buddhists are floating along nowadays is not Buddha's river. Buddha had an ocean, the ocean of eternity and life, whereas now, they just flow down a mountain river and even deny the existence of God, while the meaning of Buddhism was to reach liberation, whereas now it is to attain the peace of subpersonality in order not to become an active subpersonality. And to spend one's life on that while they spend 100% of their attention, can you imagine the high cost they pay for what is cheap? Mm -hmm. I'm using modern consumerist terms. Isn't that so? Your entire life to gain peace, which costs 10% of your attention. Of course. Mm -hmm. Yet, you pay 100%. As for monks, they invest at least 90 or 95% for what you can buy eternal life. They buy, excuse me, merely peace. So, returning to subpersonality in the nine days, when, let's say, Subpersonality transfers into a new body together with the soul. It's clear that a new personality manifests there. Another person lives and manages there, while a deceased person, already as a subpersonality, is not going anywhere. He cannot influence the processes of a new life unless he is active. But that's another topic. While the nine days are passing, why are the nine days so important? After all, he settles in on the eighth day of life, because the time from the eighth day to the seventeenth day of a baby is a very important time. During this time, he is formed as personality. This is the time when consciousness is formed. And at this time, consciousness, I emphasize, secondary consciousness, examines the entire organism. The examination starts instantly meaning secondary consciousness examines the body, and so forth. We used to have videos where I told about sick babies who had birth traumas, who were one minute away from the eighth day. On the eighth day, if you are even a minute late with treatment and the activation occurs, that's it. It already takes months to heal them. It would seem it's only a minute. But what does that minute mean? Specialists conducted experiments and checked babies on the eighth day. They connected an EEG machine and observed babies who were connected to an EEG machine as a consequence of birth traumas, regardless of whether a vessel is traumatized or not. On the eighth day, there is a spike. And on the seventeenth day, there is a spike absolutely identical to the first one. What is this process? Why didn't it take place during the eight days? Why didn't it take place during the other nine days? Well, afterwards, there is a sharp spike in activation, you know? It's like a good kick to the neurons. I mean, it's as if they are turned on, or let's say more voltage has been supplied, right? So it's like the lights are turned on, and then it is back to normal. But the rhythm is already a bit different. It is interesting, because religion says that precisely on the ninth day, the final decision on the destiny of a deceased person is made. Yes, the final decision on the destiny of a deceased person is made. In other made. words, it may happen that during nine days, a subpersonality may be granted peace. Right, peace. And then, in the body of a new 
person, so to say, it will be light. This filter becomes inactive. It becomes lighter. This is decided from the 8th to the 17th day, right? Yes, from the 8th to the 17th day. The question is, how to do that? That's where the Alatiara introduced a practice, since this person, after all, he spent his time, he earned something for himself, meaning he created a household of his own. He accumulated something, it doesn't matter. Let it be just 10 spoons. That's all he earned during the life. But his relatives should allot one spoon. His spoon? His personal one, not theirs, but his. Then a deceased person attains peace, and relatives can calmly use nine spoons. But if relatives use ten of his spoons, they will pay him with their lives. There is a law here too. After all, you use something for which a person received, let's say, punishment, while you use it in your life. Is it possible to evade God's law and God's physics when people withhold? It's impossible. Let's say. It's impossible and unrealistic. I'll give a simple example. For instance, a person, a businessman. Let's put it this way. Sowed a field and harvested 100 sacks of wheat. Next year, he took a couple fields more from other neighbors for himself, and he needs 90 sacks to sow all the fields. How many does that leave in his profit? 10 sacks. He sowed 9 sacks right. and harvested a 100, and now he needs 90 sacks to sow all the fields. He kind of invests in business. Hence, how many does he have left? 10 sacks, right? But originally, right. he had nine sacks, mm -hmm. so his profit is one sack. Mm -hmm. He has to give 10% of his profit. Well, how much is it? Let's say a sack contains 50 kilograms. Does this mean he has to give just 5 kilograms? Right? Well, yes, from his profit. That's actually the profit. Then a person will never attain peace. Never. Why? Because his profit. He sowed nine sacks, for example, right? He harvested 100 sacks. He received 91 sacks of profit. He sowed nine sacks while he received 100 sacks. The profit was given to him because he invested attention. He bought 91 sacks at the cost of his own life. Right? He spent his time on 91 sacks. It doesn't matter, he bought them at the cost of his own life. Instead of buying peace or life for himself, he bought himself 91 sacks of wheat. That's how much richer or poorer he became in life. To each his own. But this is material gain. So, he has to give a tithe from 91 sacks and not 5 kilos from one sack then it is fair. However, if he gave short weight or deceived someone at that, he should give 20% in order to sleep in peace afterwards. This is written in that very Torah as well, in all religions. Why? Because it was problematic to remove that. Also, firstly, at the beginning of religion formation, a lot of people knew about this, and it turned out to be extremely profitable for religion too. This is fundraising. And what did they begin to build and strengthen on those funds? Their own power and domination over people. To buy indulgences for one's unrighteous They made people buy them. Absolutely right. right. To simply pay off while leading a bad life. The question, is it possible to buy off from those who aspire to power, to earthly power? Meaning, whom will you give your 10% to obtain peace? Satan, will you attain peace or not? After all, what did the Lord say? There will be no one between me and you, only you and I. But where did the self-appointed priests come from who began to impose that they are intermediaries? Do you actually know who the intermediaries are? With great reserve, so to say. But if we look at this honestly, then yes, those would be the representatives of the spiritual world, those who live by the spiritual, those who become alive themselves and help others. Indeed, those who represent the interests of the spiritual world on earth. 
then it counts. That's who the Alatiara were. And this worked. You know, I've always been interested in this question because, on the one hand, you encounter that in the Bible. Let's say that very Jesus sort of didn't deny the tithe, up to the point that there were stories in the Bible where he observed and said, rich people, let's say, put into the treasury that much, while the poor widow gave her entire livelihood, everything she had. Well, yes, when the rich put a lot. Right, but that's nothing compared to what… While the poor widow put two coins. And he said, look, she… She actually put more than everyone else. Of course. After all, it doesn't matter. It's not important how much you put. Actually, we just counted on the example of a businessman, right? And just imagine, there came a woman who gave a tithe. She gave a spoonful of grain. That's all she had. While that rich businessman gave five kilos. Is that really comparable? Who actually measures and by what? You see, in the spiritual world, this is measured by the truth. It is measured by your attention, by your power, by your investment the real one, how much love you give and how much attention you invest. But if we take the spiritual world and liberation, it cannot be achieved without love. You don't buy. It doesn't work. You don't buy anything. You can buy something here. After all, a human, a subpersonality, stays in the domain of the prince of this world, in the mortal and material world, and he will die a second time anyway. It's inevitable, and it will happen. Yes, it may happen after thousands and thousands of years, but it will happen. Whereas in the spiritual world, a human exists always. He becomes an equal among the equals. That's the point, friends. That's what is worth living for. That's what is worth working for. When it comes to gaining life, economizing on one's own attention is silly. It's ridiculous. But anything can happen in life. A person has a family, responsibility, he has to feed them, he wants something better and greater for them, and so on. And he himself wants to live too. You know, he is so bogged down in slavery, but he is afraid of death. He is afraid of the torments that await him. That's why the Alatiara offered such a way out a tithe of attention. What does this peace, let's say this state of peace of a subpersonality, give for those who remain here? Well, first and foremost, precisely, for the sake of those who remain here, this law was introduced, which, again, exists by permission of the spiritual world at their behest. Why? Because relatives who remain here do not feed the system, they don't feed the dead person. When a subpersonality is asleep, it doesn't eat the living, in the literal sense of the word. It's not for nothing that there emerged legends and tales about vampires and everything else, that the dead ones or a dead man devours the living. This is really so. No matter how good, beautiful, and loving a person may have been in life, when he becomes a subpersonality, he is like a naked nerve. He needs help, so he will grasp at anyone he can reach. He is hungry. Right. And in order to satisfy this hunger, he… Well, again, who are the closest ones? Whose image is the brightest and most vivid in him? That's the answer. And who suffers? Relatives do. At this point, all of a sudden, misfortunes, diseases, or distractions begin to emerge. Why? Because people begin to think about this and invest in it. In other words, he helps the system to rob his relatives, to put it simply, because he becomes part of the system. He is no longer the same person he was. He has no chance of life. So, in order to help relatives, first and foremost, to protect the living from the dead, this law was actually introduced, and again, in order to help a dead person as well. Why not? Yet, there's another thing which is quite important. After all, a person becomes either an active or a sleeping subpersonality. A lot depends on that as well. For example, a person remains an active subpersonality. And when he enters a new body, he can doom the new personality to be the first type. I mean, why? Because it is active. And personality already poorly hears the spiritual world. It's already more difficult for it to reach the spiritual world. It is harder to come to it. 
this very glass becomes darker and less light comes through. There are fewer reference points. While a sleeping subpersonality is transparent, in other words, it doesn't hinder. There are many advantages here for the person himself, for the living, and for the next personality too. The interests of the spiritual world are observed and the interests of the system are observed, meaning everything is balanced. Let me give a simple example. If we consider, remember, you and I talked about a single world government, yes, sure. which will be forced to reduce the number of people in the current conditions. Well, everyone knows about it. Many people talk about it, let's say, from 8 billion to at least 500 million. Why? Because of the environment, climate, because there's a shortage and a lot of problems, right? And an uncontrollable crowd at the same time. 500 million is an ideal society for both the Earth and governance. There are enough slaves, but they litter less compared to 8 billion. Is that logical? It is logical. Yet, what about the 7.5 billion subpersonalities? Are they redistributed to the newly born ones? Definitely, of course. So it turns out that basically the future society in the event of population reduction… I'll put it this way, per one living, emerging vessel, there can be not just one subpersonality, but even a dozen of them on one carrier, or maybe even more. That's the answer. Therefore, dormant subpersonalities are transparent. They cause much less harm. And just imagine, if such a thing really happens, what chances would those 500 million have? Who will be born already those new ones? Surely. Where the soul will come, right? The next generations, of course. The sheerest first type. The first type. Without any connection. Absolutely correct. Connection with the soul is barely perceptible. Without prospects. Question, will this society be able to develop spiritually? Will it be interesting for the spiritual world? No. Why? Because the rights of the spiritual world are violated. The monad is overbalanced to the other side. So, expansion of the human population is also a relief of this burden, right? It's a natural process, of course. That's why I said that in the creative society, even 25 billion is not enough, and 50 billion is not enough, because this is really good. The Earth will provide enough food, there is no problem with that. New scientific achievements easily resolve it, plus expansion to other planets. It is really easy to do that in the creative society. So it turns out there is actually such a point that the sphere is closed and a lot of subpersonalities have sort of accumulated over the whole time of its existence. Yes, better not to count. Oh, you know, another question arises here. How many people live in the modern world? Well, and how great the surge in the birth rate is? There is an answer to that. Let's say, if we look, clearly, some people will be indignant or something else. There is the experience of psychologists, psychiatrists and so on, who encountered active subpersonalities in a human. Sometimes there are dozens of them, and sometimes even more. Those are absolutely different people with their own life experiences and whatnot. If you use proper hypnosis techniques, you can draw a subpersonality out, and a person will tell you about his entire existence in full detail, meaning activation of a subpersonality takes place. They say it's a product of imagination, a fiction. You know, a person is unable to invent something that happened in reality and is confirmed historically. He is unable. For instance, we wanted to implement this kind of project back then. It would have been a wonderful project where people would eventually come to this understanding, to a contact with subpersonalities, and many would see. But the war made its adjustments. We had already started this project, but didn't have time to develop it. Well, God's will guides everything. Oh, today there is so much interesting feedback and answers in general. Igor Mikhailovich. That's the truth of life. We have merely scratched the surface. May I also raise the following question, which guys have asked. In fact, when a person loses his life, does he immediately realize that he is a subpersonality and what horror awaits him? Let's say, what happens to a person who is a subpersonality? No, a person doesn't experience horror at once. Horror comes to him after the ninth day. So there is also the stage. Yet, yeah, the understanding of the fact that he died comes immediately, but hope remains. So far, you know, 
There is such a saying, like in the anecdote, do not confuse a vacation with permanent residence, just like that. But when a person gains life, so to say, does he feel that at the very moment of gaining life, of merging already here during the life of his body? And does he feel how it actually happens at the level of feelings when the earthly life goes away? What happens? A person doesn't feel it in any way. That's the entire phenomenon. Again, let's say there are several ways. There are people who are specifically at the service of the spiritual world, and they deserve this knowledge to be revealed to them. They use special practices, and when a person uses precisely special practices, a great outburst takes place for him, you know? I would compare it, just imagine, your mental abilities, mental ones, I emphasize, increase many times. When everything that used to be dark around you becomes illuminated, that is, you cannot confuse it with anything else. It's when you have a full awareness of your life and that there is no way back. However, this is for those who really use proper practices for proper purposes. It certainly doesn't happen to masses of people. And there is a certain pattern in that. I mean, what will happen to a person when he finally achieves this merging, gains life, and enlightenment comes? There won't be any enlightenment, friends, and nothing will change. Let's say, you go to bed being inevitably dead or potentially alive, and wake up alive, but it happens through sleep. Will a person understand it in the morning? He won't understand anything. At least by indirect indications. Well, by indirect ones, there is an understanding. Consciousness becomes more timid. It sort of shows its teeth, but doesn't bite that much. And the understanding of life becomes sort of more correct, you know? It's like a person has matured. If you delve in, yes, it is noticeable. A person becomes mature, more confident and calmer, but he's already alive. The only difference is that he won't be able to fall, you see? Angels don't fall. This is true. He won't do a foolish thing. Why? Because he would rather sacrifice his own body than take someone else's life. He will never do that. Why? Because he's an angel. It's not him who gave this life, so he cannot take it. He's not the devil to take someone else's. That's what will take place indeed. And let's say, it will be actually unnoticeable for him. Will consciousness bark? It will. Will consciousness continue to be afraid? It will. It surely will. It's just that, yes, emotions don't touch a person that much, but it's not because empathy hasn't developed. No, emotions of precisely fear or some stupidity, you will sense them, but you won't pay for them so diligently, let's say. You will hear that you are being deceived, so to say, and there is an intention to take a coin out of your wallet. You know, as for that, yes, understanding comes, but as for a person to expressly realize that, no, he doesn't realize. Do you know why it happens? Why? So that a person wouldn't stop, but continue to mature. After all, here in this world, a person can develop and reach the level of a bodhisattva. Can you imagine what this is? We already discussed this. It is the level of, let's say, a professor or an academician, in our terms, and not just a school graduate. Here, time is compressed and education of personality advances by leaps and bounds, whereas there, it may take a tremendous amount of time. Again, will he as personality, as an angel, want to develop intensely? Yes, he will develop. This is inevitable and infinite. But what's the rush? It's different there. Consciousness will never understand at what stage of development personality is. Of course, it won't. It's impossible to assess this by consciousness. It's impossible. Therefore, this process is hidden from a person until he comes out. But again, when the body ceases to exist and a person comes out, that's why I said, until he comes out, then such a metamorphosis takes place that, well, there's one more little point, a person's practices. This response of love becomes kind of circular. There is no sending and receiving, you know? Kind of receiving and transmitting, no. It is life. Right. Life just flows already. This is a precious moment. Again, these are the subtleties which you begin to understand later. When you have already gained life, 
already afterwards, at the next stages of development, when you graduate from the university, so to say. It's just that many people ask to the following question. There is prana, there is the life of this body. How does it happen that some people who achieve spiritual salvation, do they actually make some kind of decision either to leave despite the fact that prana hasn't ended? I'll explain this from practice. Or to return to serve. I'll explain from practice. Even those who intend to serve seriously, take the path of service and perform special practices as soon as life awakens in a person, he quickly disappears from this world. Why? Because the taps are in his hands, you see? Prana is like gasoline in a car. He pours it out and leaves. But who will serve? That's the question. There are many of those willing to take the short path, even with the desire from consciousness to serve the spiritual world afterwards. But when an understanding comes, when this enlightenment comes, while you are still in the body, you understand the worthlessness of this world. You understand all this elusiveness in this entire game. And here's the paradox. Being not quite mature, let's say, as an angel, you already begin to perceive other people as unworthy of your staying here to help them. Well, there is such a weakness. An angel should mature, an angel should grow up. Then there will be understanding of the whole process. Why? Because until you experience this delight in the influx of your kind, you will not understand the preciousness and importance of it all. But when you understand this, you do your best to make the infinite, angelic world multiply manyfold every moment. Well, it's hard to understand this by our consciousness. But one thing is absolutely clear, a person will not be able to depart just like that without special practices. I'll put it this way, so that people understand. In earthly terms, imagine that you accidentally found an electronic wallet that someone once gave you, where you had a couple of thousand bitcoins, costing 50 cents back then, in the past. Now, all of a sudden, you see that Bitcoin is skyrocketing and rising beyond $100,000 each. Yes, can you feel the scale of the increase? Such a joy. Well, you can imagine how wildly you would react to such news, right? You had a couple of thousands in your wallet. You found it by accident. Well, there is such an increase but it is nothing compared to the real joy of an angel. It's just that I needed to draw a parallel somehow. For people might say, angels rejoice because Bitcoin is rising. You know how consciousness twists things. Well, that does happen. It's consciousness after all, right? There is still another question, if you don't mind. When a person is liberated, when he becomes free and already leaves this, so to say, mundane life, does he remember what happened here? Or is there only the feeling of love and that's it? And there is no, let's say, memory of what happened here? Yes, there is a tremendous feeling of love, an understanding of cause and effect, relations of the entire world structure. I emphasize, not only of this universe and not only of this life. Does he remember his life? Yes, every moment, every moment, I emphasize. Moreover, he remembers it not only the way we remember, okay? but he remembers even a breath of light wind, even the voice of every bird, and even the work of every cell. It's a different world. He remembers, he remembers everything, while subpersonality merely remembers every instant of its life, each of them. Everything that you remember, my friend, what you remember is what will remain if, God forbid, Satan overcomes you. Yet if God helps, and you have enough courage and love, and you become an angel, you will remember everything. And you will even remember this moment. Only you will perceive it differently and understand it better. Not the way you understand it now, by your consciousness. That's how simple everything is.
and a lot of things remain in your memory. Igor Mikhailovich, can a person, while being here, let's say, connect with a person who has gained life? How? What phone number to dial? Well, I mean, a lot of people address, let's say, those very images of holy people who for sure became saints and gained life. Let's suppose a person knows that a certain holy person actually gained life. Let's say, can an appeal to him somehow spiritually strengthen the person or help him? To cure him physically or something else? Well, probably in the spiritual aspect. Well, in the spiritual aspect, as an example, it can. Just as an example, as a person who has attained life, but can a dead one contact an alive one? No, of course not, my friends. And I'm saying it once again, no. While the one who has gained life can do that, but only if you know him personally. If you don't know the one you want to contact, you won't contact him. That makes sense too, even if you have gained life. Well, what's actually the purpose of contacting him? To be strengthened spiritually, then you should immediately head straight to the source of love. If you have gained life, you don't need strengthening anymore. That's the point. But when you are on the way, the image of a true saint who has gained life can certainly help you by his example, by his life, it can. But the question is different. What do we go to temples, to images for? For health? For a solution to our problems? We pay with our attention. And what? Sometimes we even gain health, don't we? But what comes into action? A simple example. Some kind of a magical saint prayed for us, whom everyone considers a saint during his lifetime, and we suddenly recover. Is that possible? Yes. There are a lot of such cases, friends, far and wide. This is called the placebo effect. That is, with your attention, with your faith in something inevitably dead, you buy something inevitably dead, even your own health, after all. It is not alive. It is valuable to us as long as we are in the body, and it is significant as long as we are in the body. But the Lord didn't give those mechanisms, those are the devil's mechanisms. Merely in dead bodies, in inevitably dead bodies, I emphasize. Yet, you pay with your life for that very health, for that very resolution of problems with a near and dear person. Isn't that true? Don't you have a tongue, my friend, to go and talk openly with that near and dear one, if you care about him or her? Or have you forgotten a way to the hospital where doctors work to heal your body? Yes, some people will say there are diseases that doctors cannot cure, but if you go to a mage or a priest, it's exactly the same in this case. They perform a witchcraft ritual or recite a prayer, but that prayer is directed to the devil, just like the witchcraft ritual, and you gain health. Yes, you gain it, but you give your life for it. And then what? What's next? What's the point of your health that you are going to use, even if you're going to use it for 50 years, even a hundred years? Doesn't matter. What will that give you? Nothing, in my opinion. Meanwhile, we should develop science and medicine so that there wouldn't be such problems, right? Right. Because through science, we can solve all health problems. And through science, we can really prove that the world actually exists, including the spiritual world, right? Everything is possible if we want it. One of our viewers asked the following question. He is already in such a mature age, he is in his 70s, and he came across the true knowledge very late. So he says, I'm very worried that I won't have time to save myself, so is it possible to at least deserve peace in that world? If a person is in his old age, let's say, little time remains, and it is clear that, purely from a mathematical perspective, he doesn't have enough either time or energy to gain at least peace. This is precisely one of the cases for which the Alatyara introduced that tithe. It resolves a lot of problems in the literal sense of the word. But it doesn't work in the consumerist format of society. Well, in the consumerist format, it doesn't work. You can do nothing about that. It is clear. 
that those institutions here, which are supposed to represent the interests of the spiritual world, work for themselves. They work for power, as we already said. They work for hoarding, and it is clear that they don't function properly. But we are now talking about the time of the Alatiara, in the times when there were those who truly served the spiritual world, when this law was introduced. And this really worked. Why? Because a person lived his life, he worked, he was basically a good man, but he didn't invest. And at this point, he feels, he finds out that he has health problems, and two days remain for him to live. Is it possible to become saved within two days? Of course not, surely not, but he can attain peace. The tithe resolves a lot of such acute issues. However, you know, this is merely a talk about peace. These are not talks about life. Certainly, those who come from that world can grant even life, even for a little angel who will have to mature for a long time, since it matures not in this world, not in these hothouse conditions for maturation of an angel. Some people will say, what do you mean hothouse conditions? Yes, my friends, this world is exactly a hothouse for angels. It's just that many do not sprout, just like many seeds don't. But the choice to sprout or not to sprout is in each of us. This should also be understood. Everything occurs by our choice. As for conditions, indeed, we can hardly think of better ones for maturation of an angel. One should try at least two and a half hours during the day to devote to spiritual practice. one's attention to spiritual practice. Right. This is in order to gain, pardon me, peace. But it's not, it's not that payment for eternal life. For that, you should do your best, you should live by that. Well, that's an option too. If we again take that very tithe, if in this world the tithe would really be allocated where it should have been allocated originally, we would now live, really live. I won't say in the creative society, we would live in the ideal society a long time ago, friends. Why? Because it would be possible to develop a truly beautiful world. Imagine, when a mass of people supports, again, that very institution, well, it wouldn't be an institution of religion, it would be a community of people that represents the spiritual world and defends its positions here. Well, with such support, there would have been an ideal society a long time ago. And perhaps there would probably be no sub-personalities as such at all people would gain life. But unfortunately, we have what we have. Therefore, funds that people give to institutions are a support for organizations for which, let's say, service is a job. Yet, when life becomes a job, it's not life. Here's actually the answer, friends, to why we are in such a world and in such chaos, when there are so many various religions and a tremendous, many times prevalent number of believers. We live in hell, where Satan predominates. A simple answer. And it is true. Unfortunately, this is so. There is an understanding, Igor Mihailovich, of how great the Creative Society is for a person's spiritual life as well. Because, first of all, as we already discussed, the load on newborn people does decreases. Of course. There are less people of the first type and more of those who feel this connection with the soul. Chances for spiritual salvation increase. And there is time. This is very important. There is time for you to spend it on spiritual development. Of course. After all, development of the Creative society means freeing up time for people who are forced to spend it on work, on providing themselves with even a minimal living for today. This is really so. Also, in society where, after the transition, such a concept as money disappears… Oh, that's indeed. Power disappears and money disappears. The truth automatically remains. But there is a disadvantage. If in society, where there is accumulation, as an equivalent of your attention, you can pay off through buying a state of peace for yourself as a sub-personality, then in a world where monetary units and power are abolished, 
you won't have anything to buy it with. You will have to work on yourself spiritually. Well, by that time, I hope… And there is everything for that. Yes, I hope by that time people will have knowledge and willingness will come too. That's people's choice. Nothing can be done about that. Great, thank you. The main thing is to strive for that. And the main thing is to develop this life within oneself. That's the most important point. To form this life. And life within oneself, my friends, begins through love. Therefore, let's just love each other. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Igor Mihailovich. Thank you, friends, for being with us. Thank you.